In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Do sit down. Well, good morning and welcome to our service this morning. It's lovely to see you all as ever. Welcome also to those of you who are joining us live on Facebook or over the telephones. As always, you are all most welcome with us in worship this morning. It's the fourth Sunday of Trinity, but those of you who are very keyed in to the lectionary and the, uh, the readings that we should be having may spot that the readings we're having today are not the readings for the fourth Sunday of Trinity, because when we planned our Father's Day service last week and decided that the story of Jairus's daughter would be a good one to use for Father's Day, I didn't realize that that was the reading for today. So we're using last week's readings, which we didn't use last week. Anyway, so we're calming the storm today. Um, that was a very long rambling way of saying if you were expecting Jairus' daughter today, it's not. <laughs> However, after all that, let's take a moment of quiet together as we prepare ourselves in God's sight and allow ourselves to awaken to God's presence with us this morning. So we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Do you know, it always makes me giggle. It doesn't matter how long I waffle for at the beginning of the service. It's always the moment when I say, let's be quiet together when the bell ringers start coming down the stairs. <laughs> it's lovely, and we're very grateful to have them with us. So as we come before God this morning, we remember that no matter how hard we try, there are times when we let him down, we fail to live as he would wish us to. And so we come before God in penitence this morning. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray the collect for this fourth Sunday of Trinity. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy 
that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so we turn our thoughts to God's word and Maureen's going to read for us. The first reading is taken from the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 1 to 11. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, who is, that this, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and said bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stopped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Maureen. Would you like to stand for the gospel? Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took, him with him, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Do sit down. May God speak through my words this morning and into each of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. I had the, uh, the pleasure last Monday morning of having a trip to South Shields. It was a work trip. I had to take the, uh, the, the Book of Remembrance from St Paul's across to a calligrapher that we've found over there. And it turned out to be a nice sunny afternoon. So I thought, well, I've never been to South Shields before, I don't think. Uh, so I'll just have a little bit of an explore. So uh, I had a walk along the beach there and uh, because I'd gone for work, I was in, you know, smart trousers and smart shoes and I did take my dog collar off on the beach. But I thought, I can't be here and not have a paddle. So I rolled up my trousers and I took off my socks and shoes and had a paddle along the beach there. And it was just so beautiful. And there's something so restorative, isn't there, about being beside the sea. I'm not, I, I, I've got I do like to be beside the seaside in my head. I'm not going to sing that to you this morning. But there's definitely something. There's something that connects us deeply with who we are and who God is, I think, when we stand and we look out at the expanse of the sea. And for most of us, going to the sea is a, is a, a positive thing. It's a good thing. 
But in our story today, we see the darker side of the sea and of the power of nature. And the sea in the ancient world was often something that was dreaded. The sea was, was treated as a kind of power in its own right. It was the source of evil sea monsters. And what some of the ancient world um, renderings of the, crea the creation story talk about it as the powers of good overpowering the sea monsters to create harmony and, uh, and peace. And so similarly, in Mark's gospel, the sea is often a place of threat, a place of evil, a place where our discipleship might be challenged and where life hangs in the balance. And as we see them setting off on the Sea of Galilee, we see this storm whip up. It's the end of a long day. Jesus has been teaching the, the crowds who've come to him. There've been, there were so many of them on the shore that they've got into a boat. They've just put off a little way from the shore so that they can't crowd right in on, them, on him. And he's been teaching all day. He's absolutely shattered. And so he says to the, the disciples, look, let's, let's just go. Let's go across to the other side of the sea and have a break. And Mark makes a special point of saying that Jesus just went as he was. He didn't go home for his wellies and his oil skins or his flip-flops or whatever. He just went as he was. And he clearly wasn't really expecting trouble. Otherwise, he would never have suggested it. And in amongst that crowd of disciples, as we know, there were some very, very experienced fishermen who likewise would not have set sail across the Sea of Galilee if they had felt that there was any danger. But one of the features of the Sea of Galilee is that it lies in a hollow surrounded by hills and the wind can funnel down between the hills and whip up a storm very, very quickly. And that's obviously what happened on this occasion. They set out in calm seas and then within minutes, this storm, this really fierce storm blew up. And those experienced fishermen, the disciples weren't, of course, all fishermen, but even the experienced fishermen among them were frightened by the ferocity of this storm, with the winds crashing and the waves bashing against the side of the boat. This is a fishing boat. It would have had low sides so that they could reach over to haul in the nets. And so they were in danger of being swamped. And in the midst of all of this that's going on, they sometimes seem to suddenly think, oh yeah, we've got Jesus with us. Why don't we ask him to do something? And they turn around to see where he is and what he's doing. And there he is, lying in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. I love that little detail from Mark. His head on a cushion and he's absolutely spark out. He is dead to the world, sleeping like a baby. And the disciples can't believe it. How can he possibly be sleeping in the midst of all of this that's going on with the wind howling and the waves crashing and the boat pitching and heaving? And the disciples are not only terrified, they're upset. And as they wake Jesus up, the words that they say to him are not, Jesus, please, we need your help. They're Teacher, don't you care? Don't you care that we're perishing? They're so frightened. And Jesus opens his eyes, looks around him, assesses the situation, and basically tells the wind and the waves to put a sock in it. That, uh, where, where, where our translation says, peace, be still, that second one, be still, literally is translated as, it's like putting a muzzle on a dog. So it really is, shut up, just, you know, shut up. And of course, the wind and the waves instantly stop. And instead of it taking several hours for those high seas to calm down, like we know it usually would, instead, it's instant. There is sudden, flat calm. And that seems to be what frightens the disciples more than anything else. It's not just the fact that Jesus can tell the storm to stop. It's that he can have this totally overpowering effect over the, the natural elements, that they just stop what they're doing 
at his word. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this indeed? Clearly, he's no mere teacher, no run-of-the-mill miracle worker. He's doing the things that only God has the power and the authority to do. As we heard in that passage from Job that Maureen read, where God says to, when Job's thrown all these complaints and accusations against God, God comes to him and he says, where were you? Where were you when I put the earth together? Where were you when I put the sea in its place and when I told it how to behave? Only God has authority over the wind and the waves. But somehow, despite everything that the disciples have seen up to this point of who Jesus is and what Jesus does, they still haven't quite got hold of that deep, fact of who he is, that he is indeed God, that he is indeed the one who has authority over nature. Well, we may never have crossed the Sea of Galilee, and I would imagine that there are some of us probably here who have. Richard, you've, you've crossed the Sea of Galilee, haven't you? You've been on the boat in the Sea of Galilee, and has. I missed that day on our trip to, uh, to, uh, to Israel. I had sunstroke, which was really clever. But whether or not we've crossed the Sea of Galilee, we've all been at one point or another in our lives in that boat, in the storm, when circumstances around us have felt out of control. We often talk about going through the storms of life. And we know that sometimes we can avoid difficult things happening to us by being sensible, by saving for a rainy day, by trying to live our lives the way that God asks us to, but there are some storms that we can't find our ways around. They just happen. They come out of the blue and they overwhelm us. Sometimes we just find ourselves in the midst of that storm with the waves crashing around us and the wind howling, those moments when we feel so utterly and totally out of control of life. This last year, while we've been trying to come to grips with the coronavirus, that has been like one of those storms which has overwhelmed us not just on an individual level but on a national and a global level. And we know where we want to get to, we know where our destination in our journey through the storm is but we don't know really where we'll end up or when we're going to get there. And we know that we should be confident in God, that we should be able to relax and put our trust in God and know that God will bring us through this storm, as indeed he will. But in our humanity and in our frailty, who of us among us has not in the last 15 months turned to God and said, where are you? Don't you care that we are suffering? In our story, when the wind ceased and the waves became calm, Jesus questioned the disciples' fear and lack of faith. But it's worth noticing that he never said there's nothing to be afraid of. He said, don't be afraid. And those two things are not quite the same thing. There there was something to fear in that storm. It could have sunk the boat. It could have drowned them. But Jesus says, you don't need to be afraid because I'm with you in the boat. I'm with you in the storm. And when those storms rage around us, whatever they might be, whether it's illness or unemployment or bereavement, when the waves crash and the winds roar, we're challenged by Jesus to find our faith, to dig deep and put our faith in Jesus. And as we do that, as we grow in faith, we come to understand that those storms never have the last word. Faith doesn't take away the storms, but faith enables us to sail through the eye of the storm and come out the far side unharmed because Jesus rides that boat with us and never lets us go. In that boat, of course, there were 12 disciples, not just one, and there were other boats with them. They were in 
community, if you like. There was a little community of them crossing the sea that day. And if the last year has taught us anything, it's the importance of community, of being connected and staying connected to one another, even when we've been forced to be apart. And there's been a sense that we're all in it together, that we are in the same boat. That's a phrase that we often use. But actually, as time has gone by, I think it's become more and more clear that we're not quite all in the same boat, that there have been some people and some groups of people who have been far worse affected by not just the virus, but by the economic climate that it's created, by the isolation that it's created. And some people have been far worse affected than others. There's a British journalist called Damien Barr who said, I heard that we're in the same boat, but it's not that. We're in the same storm. We're not in the same boat. So we're going through the same situation, but we don't all experience it the same way. Some people, he said, are in super yachts and they're quite comfortably insulated from the worst of the effects of the coronavirus, whereas some people are in little leaky rowing boats with only one oar. And of course, he was drawing attention to the gap between the rich and the poor, those who have financial security and those who don't, those who have good support networks and families and those who find themselves alone. It's a really good reminder that when in years to come the coronavirus is no more threat than the common cold, unless we've done something to address those gaps between rich and poor and iron out those inequalities, when the next storm comes, no matter what it might be, there will still be those who are in boats with only one oar. We will still all be in different boats. And that's part of our calling as Christians, is to call out those inequalities and try and help people to become more resilient, to be able to have better equipment when the next storm comes. But whatever the storms we find ourselves in, However small and fragile our boats may seem, let's remember that we don't ever sail alone, that the one who commands the winds and the waves to be at peace is always with us. He will never leave us in those stormy waters and he will always help us to be at peace if we put our faith in him. Amen. So as Jesus calls us to put our faith in him, let's stand together and declare our faith in the words of the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
so let's sit or kneel for our prayers. I think Judith is going to lead us this morning. Let us pray for the church and for the world, and let us thank God for his goodness. Father, we come from a world where nothing is certain and where nothing is easy. We come to you with confidence to offer a little more of our lives to you. We come knowing that you will ask nothing of us that we cannot face, nothing we cannot do, nothing we cannot give so long as we rely on the presence and the power of the risen Christ. Father, we ask that by the, your Holy Spirit, you will enable us to offer you worship that is centred not on ourselves and our needs, but on you and you alone. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church, the one church of Jesus Christ throughout the world, the church that reaches all the way back through 2,000 years, and all across the world today. Let us pray for guidance, encouragement, and a genuine awareness of the immense privilege of belonging to the people of God. Let us ask God to fill his church with the Holy Spirit, that we may be equipped to worship him in the way he deserves. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Lord of all, give to all monarchs, leaders, and heads of state graciousness and integrity that all in power and authority may undertake their duties in a spirit of humility, that the oppressed may find a voice and the nations work together for the good of the world. Lord, of your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. Father, we pray for the petitions on our prayer tree. We know you to be both Lord and healer of your broken world, and we ask you to touch with your generous love all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May your love flood their lives with hope and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. In the quietness, we pray for those we know to be in need of God's peace, joy, healing power and love. And we lift before you, Lord, Una Middleton, Lawrence Britton, and Carolyn. And let us take a moment to remember anyone we know who is also in need. Draw close to them, Heavenly Father, and help them know that you understand and have promised never to forsake them and that your will is perfect. We also pray for carers, friends and loved ones. May Jesus hold them in his arms, give them hope and courage and help them know they are not alone, that he is always with them. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We know, Lord, that every child is a spe special gift from you for us to love and cherish. We know that you love, your love has no boundaries and that you love us all equally. We ask a blessing on children with special needs this morning and we name before you Imogen Norton, Nathan James, Peter Allen, Noah, Christopher, William and Charlie Armstrong, Erin, Thomas Britton, Natalie Green, a dear grandson, and Dean. Help us to remember that no matter who we are or what we are facing, we need never face it in our own strength. Lord, you have promised that the power that raised Jesus from the dead will always be available to us and that you will walk with us and love us for all eternity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, your death and resurrection proclaim the message of hope amongst the tears of our grieving for those who have died. We remember this morning, son John, daughter-in-law Joyce, and friends and family of Harry Robinson. We also remember wife Juliet, friends and family of David Higdon. Also the family and friends of Patrick Namazi, and daughter Jenny and family and friends of Michael Lynn. We ask that your love and strength will unfold them in the coming days. 
Lord, in your mercy. We ask a blessing, Father, on Claire and Peter, who married recently. We pray that you will share their joy, walk with them on their journey that they have begun, and touch all they experience together. Touch it with your grace that knows no beginning and know no end. Lord, in your mercy. The Saviour who called us is the Lord who sends us. The Lord who sends us is the Spirit who empowers us. The Spirit who empowers us is the Christ who is with us always. We go in his name and for his glory. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Judith. Jesus came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. And they were glad when they saw the Lord. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I should have done it like this, because we remembered that last week, didn't we? So peace be with you. Peace be with you. Do greet one another with the peace. Be present, be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen High Priest, make yourself known in the breaking of bread. Amen. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will, and one for you, a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup and gave you thanks he gave it to them saying drink this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of Hilda and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you. Eat in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith, with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, comfort of the afflicted and healer of the broken, you have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we say together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. I'm assuming that our young church are going to come and join us at some point. It's not on. There am I, waiting for them to come. And they're not here. Never mind, that's fine. That's fine. We'll say the Lord's Prayer in a minute. Uh, just a couple of notices then before we uh, draw our service to a close this morning. You may well have noticed as you came in that we have some beautiful new notice boards at the door there. Uh, this is so that rather than everything being crammed on a very, very small notice board, uh, we can actually spread things out. There's quite a lot of things these days that we're, we are required to display, like our safeguarding uh, notices and things like that. So we've, we've acquired a, a larger display board so that we can spread things out and actually have a, have a bit more on display about the life of our church and, uh, and the things that we do. Um, the other thing to say about that was there was a, one of the QR codes you know, that you scan in if you've got a, a mobile phone on the board behind. That's now in the porch. So if some of you can use that as you're coming in, then that will save the queue as you come in the door with everybody trying to use uh, the one on the table. So do use, do use both of the... Uh, the QR codes to scan in. Also to say that um, Sue and Glynis are still auditing keys. If you haven't um, turned up to them with your bunch of keys, uh, please could you do that as soon as possible. Glynis is aware that there are some people that haven't returned to church yet that, uh, that she hasn't seen their keys and she will, she will get round to them eventually. But if you are coming to church regularly and you haven't had your, your annual key audit, please will you do that as soon as possible. Um, there's a notice on the weekly notes about confirmation um, for what I'm hoping to do uh, 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 to get uh, either Bishop Paul or Bishop Sarah to come in the autumn and do a confirmation service for us. But I suspect that most of the people to whom that would apply are not here this morning. So I will tell them that next week. But in the meantime, if, if, if there's anybody that you know that might be thinking about being confirmed into the Church of England, then do please let them know that that's going to be a possibility in the autumn. Um, I think that's all the, all the notices. It's ironic that the, uh, the, the morning I have notices to do with our youth and young church, they're not here, but never mind, never mind. I'll catch them next time. So um, let's say the Lord's Prayer together. You might remember that last week we, uh, we had a go at using Makaton signs. So I'm going to do it that way if I can remember them all. If you'd like to join in with me, then please do. I'd better have the words in front of me because otherwise it'll all go horribly pear-shaped. So let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thou, your kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand together for the blessing? The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So let us go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.